All right, everyone, welcome back to our kitchen operations and cookery focus. So we're going to be going through that particular stream for the next half hour or so. Welcome back to our online viewers as well. Okay, cooking. I hope you've all enjoyed your hospitality course. <laughs> and you've got to cook a lot of delectable things. All right, cooking methods. Why do we cook? And how does food cook? We cook food for a number of reasons. Kill bacteria. Some foods you just simply cannot eat and, um, and serve them raw. Things like poultry. Cooking food makes it easier to digest. Imagine chewing on a raw steak. Cooking changes the taste, aroma and appearance of food. So it turns something completely different. Food is made up of water, which evaporates when you cook the food. Fats, which melt when you cook food. For example, the fat on a steak, it'll, you'll render it down, or a pork belly. Proteins, which coagulate or become firmer when they're cooked. Example, a quiche. Nutrients, such as vitamins and minerals, which are destroyed by cooking. So we need to be careful how often or how long we cook certain things for. Carbohydrates, sugars, which caramelise or become brown when cooked. Example of brulee. Starches, which gelatinise or absorb water and swell when cooked. And of course, our example there would be some rice. How is food cooked? Through heat transfer. And this is something that regularly comes up in the exam, is how food travels or how heat travels from food to its source. We have our convection method, which means currents of air, steam or water or fat that carry the heat to the food. Like when currents of hot air heat the food in an oven. Conduction, something hot touches the food. For example, a steak cooked in a fry pan. Radiation, heat that radiates from a heat source to the food. An example would be when heat radiates from the coals on a barbecue to the food. Methods of cookery that we use are categorised into two different areas. Moist or wet, that includes things like boiling, blanching, poaching, steaming, braising, stewing, deep frying. And I'm sure you've all done these methods in your practical lessons. Cooking methods are the techniques we use in the kitchen to get the results that we want. For example, you could boil or poach a steak, but would you want to? You would not get the result you want. You don't get that beautiful caramelised colour. You don't get those juices sealed inside. Cooking methods classified as either dry heat methods or moist heat methods. We also have sometimes some methods that use the two, a combination, which will involve dry heat and moist heat. So moist or wet methods means cooking food in water or with steam. Boiling. Deep fried. It's immersed in a fat so it's classed as wet. Even though it's not water, I know I did say that it usually involves steam or water, but you're, that was a good question. It's because it's submerged in the fat, it is classed as wet, even though we wouldn't put water with oil. Our dry heat methods, roasting, baking, grilling, shallow frying, stir fry or sweating. So we're cooking without water or steam, although some kind of cooking oil is often used. Dry heat methods are for foods which are naturally tender. Okay, we don't want to cook them for a very long time. The example would be fish or chicken. I'm going to go through the different methods of cookery, starting with boiling. So this is classified as a wet method. And it means to cook food in water that is bubbling rapidly. Usually foods like pastas or hearty vegetables like potatoes, pumpkin, so on. 
doesn't necessarily have to be water, it could be a stock or some other liquid. Poaching. Poaching is where we cook food in water that is hot but not bubbling. So it's ticking over at a lower temperature and it's usually for tender, delicate foods. A good example there would be poached eggs or poached fish. If we were to madly boil a piece of fish, it would just break up. Steaming. Steaming means to cook food by exposing it to steam, usually potatoes or vegetables, sometimes dumplings like the picture on the screen. Again, a wet method of cookery. So all we're doing is we're surrounded with steam. Who's lucky enough to have a combi oven in their school? Do you know what a combi oven is? <laughs> combination oven? So that's where you have a combination of steam and convection and the oven can be used on either convection, steam or a combination of the two, which can be very effective. Braising. Another wet method of cookery. With braising we tend to brown the meat first and then we cook it covered with moisture added, for example a stock or a liquid. They're always covered because we want to keep the moisture in. We seal the meat first to keep the juices sealed into that piece of meat. Normally it's cooked in the oven for a long period of time and on slow temperature. And the reason we do that is we need to break down the toughness of the meat. So usually used for large joints or large cuts of meat that are quite tough or sinewy. Normally we serve it on a mirepoix of vegetables. So mirepoix, rough cut of onion, celery and carrot. And that's to protect the meat because it'll sit on top of the vegetables rather than directly on the bottom of the pan or the pot. Also gives a bit of flavour by adding those aromatic type vegetables such as celery, carrot and onion. Stewing, very similar. Again, immersing liquid, but normally done on a stove top with a lid on the pot. Usually the meat is cut into bite sized pieces, browned, and we brown it off again to seal in those juices because we don't want to lose all that lovely tenderness from the meat as it cooks and we add in moisture. Stewing will tenderise tough cuts of meat for us. Deep frying, immersing food in hot oil. The food being cooked is generally coated creating a steam effect. So we submerge it, example would be chips or french fries usually at 180 degrees. It's important that the temperature is correct. If it's too low, the food will absorb the fat and make it greasy. If it's too high, it will burn and the inside of the meat or whatever it is you're cooking won't be cooked. It's a quite a harsh method of cookery, so it's important if you are deep frying something like chicken or fish, that it has some sort of a coating. So what sort of coatings do we put on fish or chicken? Fantastic. So we're looking crumbing, battering. It'll protect the food item. Roasting. Again, uh, so we're now moving into dry methods of cookery. Roasting or baking means to cook by exposing food to hot, dry air in an oven. So example, there is a roast. Spit roasting, the food is cooked by the heat radiating from the flames above a fire or coals. When you oven roast, the food is cooked by the convection of heat through the dish and the airspace in the oven. Baking, similar to roasting, but we don't add any fat. So dry heat creates a visual appeal, produces nice flavours and textures for us generally associated with desserts, cakes. Things like delicate foods such as 
cream caramel or baked custards. We cook them what we call au bain marie. That's where the item is submerged in a water bath. And we do that because we don't want to get that boiled effect of the custard. If you ever um, made a cream caramel and you've tipped it out and it's got air bubbles in it, that means the temperature was too high. Grilling. Probably one of our favourite pastimes in Australia is to cook a barbecue. So this is where we cook food on metal bars over radiant heat. Barbecuing is almost identical, except the heat traditionally comes from wood or charcoal. But these days we have our gas barbecues. In America they call this broiling. Broiling, broiling, yes. This is a great way to cook a steak because it seals in the natural juices of the steak. And the reason um, it's such a good method for cooking a steak is because all those bacteria gets killed because you're sealing the outside of the meat. So we need to remember, it's another reason we cook food is to kill off bacteria. Does anyone know why we can eat a rare steak? Why it's okay? So I just said something there about bacteria on the outside of food. Correct. Beautiful. Thank you. Bacteria is found on the outside of the meat. So that's why you can eat a rare steak. If we were to mince that steak up, we would need to make sure we thoroughly cooked it, wouldn't we? Because all that outside surface would have gone into the middle. Shallow frying. I often find this an interesting one with students. It's one that we need to really watch our temperature control. We don't want it too hot. So we're using a moderate amount of oil, but it's essential you control your temperature. I'm sure you've all cooked a chicken schnitzel or a veal schnitzel at school. And some of you might have found that your crumbs became a bit too dark before your meat was actually cooked. So it's essential you watch your temperature here. The idea would be that you'd have at least a half to a centimetre of oil in your pan so it um, evenly cooks the crumbs of your schnitzel. So we're cooking in a moderate amount of fat over a moderate heat. Usually breaded foods like cutlets or chicken or are pan fried. Stir frying, very fast method of cookery and one in which you would not do until you're just about ready to serve. It's, it's a last minute sort of operation. Usually done in a wok. It's usually meat, fish or vegetables. We cook it rapidly over a very high heat. We stir briskly or toss it. And we, as I said, we prepare it and do it right just before service. Sauteing. Sauteing is to cook food quickly in a middle amount of fat over a relatively high heat, similar to stir frying. And once again, we toss it quickly in a pan with very little fat and a fairly high heat. Sweating is something we shallow, oh, sweating is another method where we um, involve in shallow frying. You may have been asked, you may see a recipe and it says to sweat the onion. And what that means is to cook it on a very low gentle heat without colouring. Because the more you colour, the more flavour there is. What we want to do is just extract a nice gentle sort of a flavour. So we sweat, usually with a small amount of oil or butter. And you stir it often to ensure you get rid of any excess moisture. Sweating will result in tender, sometimes translucent pieces, so the onion can become quite clear. Can anyone think of any other methods of cookery? That I haven't mentioned. Some very trendy ones at the moment. If you've been watching a lot of the cooking shows, one of the most popular things they do at the moment is submerging food in water. 
What, does anyone know what that's called? CV? Yeah, that's it. Blanching is correct, yes. So that's very popular at the moment, CV. And what it does is it produces very tender cuts of meat because it's cooked on a very, very low temperature. And then um, can be done with a steak. And then I've seen what I've um, seen chefs do is then they cook it in the water bath and then they might seal the steak on a grill or even hit it with a, um, a torch to get that caramelised effect on the outside. Um, one I, I did mention, microwaving. We've all done a bit of microwaving. Not my preferred method of cookery, I'm not a fan of it. Good for reheating and defrosting. But some people like it because it suits their lifestyle and there's nothing wrong with that, but I, it's not my preferred method of cookery. Microwaving can be quite dangerous in that you can get lots of uh, steam burns and the things that come out of the microwave can be incredibly hot, so you need to be very careful. All right, moving on to kitchen equipment. I'm sure you've all heard the term, Miss on Plus. What does it mean? Thank you. Everything in its place. So glad you know that. So it involves all the preparation we do beforehand. You can't walk into a kitchen, into a service period, and have no food prepped. It's just going to be disastrous and you're going to get people walk out and have complaints left, right and centre. French term, meaning everything in its place, refers to the preparation carried out before the day's cooking begins. You must play, uh, pay careful attention to your mise en place. It's the vital first step in your daily routine. Take the time to write a list of what needs to happen. Work out, prioritise what needs to happen first. If you're confident that everything required for the day, including equipment, food stuff, and serving dishes are in place and ready to use, you are more likely to maintain a smooth and even workflow throughout the day. This means you can concentrate all your efforts on producing quality products with maximum efficiency and minimal stress. Two very important words. Hospitality or kitchens are very fast paced, busy places. If you are going to walk from one end of the kitchen to the other and not think strategically about what you're getting or what you're doing, you're going to be clocking up a lot of steps and you're going to be fall behind in your tasks and you're going to get very stressed out. So it's really important to take five to ten minutes at the start of your shift to work out what needs to happen. Things left un, uh, undone during preparation time or food poorly prepared can easily lead to chaos in the kitchen at the critical time of service and that's when you don't want your chaos because it'll have a flow on effect. Your wait staff uh, will become stressed. They'll, um, they will in turn will get harassed by their customers. They will then come back to the kitchen harassing you for the food. And it just becomes a very vicious cycle. Principles of mise en place. Correctly selecting a recipe. Ordering ingredients. Selecting required ingredients. Accurate measuring and weighing of ingredients. Very important. Selecting and preparing equipment. Preparing the ingredients as specified in the recipe to produce a quality end product. Many businesses have standard recipe cards and they do this for a reason. It's cost effective. They want their product to um, maintain quality. Imagine you go to a particular restaurant every once a month and you have the Viol Cordon Bleu because they do it really well and you just love how they do it. And then someone else comes along and makes the recipe for you and they do their own recipe and not the standard recipe. And you don't like it you know, businesses will lose customers. It's essential you have that standard and you follow it. It's important all ingredients, equipment are organised prior to the commencement of your food preparation so that excess energy does not get wasted walking back and forth across the kitchen to collect ingredients. It's hard work working in a kitchen, I can tell you from experience. It's physically demanding. It's... Um, puts a lot of pressure mentally. So it's got both aspects. Some jobs are physical, some are mental. It's actually both. So you really need to work smarter 
and not harder. Kitchen equipment. For cooks and chefs, tray tools, equipment and utensils are just as important as recipes. Okay, we all have our knives that we love. Every art or profession requires an operator to be skilled in the proper use and care of those tools and utensils. Success in the kitchen also depends on a thorough knowledge of equipment. If you know how to use all the equipment properly, you'll have a better product. If you're using the right equipment for the right job, you'll have a better product and you'll maintain safety as well. For example, using a meat slicer to slice up um, meat. Uh, sorry, that's a bad example. It's a meat, it is a meat slicer. I'll talk about my husband when he was an apprentice chef. He was left there on his own for the day. He was a first year apprentice. The chef had gone home and he got a whole rump and used the slicer to slice it up because he was not confident in his own knife skills to cut it. He used it without the guard and of course to get the thickness of a steak like that he had to open the blade up that wide and put his hand straight into it requiring numerous stitches. So one he didn't use the guard, he wasn't properly trained, he was using the piece of equipment for the wrong reason and as a result he ended up being injured. He's still got the scar. So, and he's now 54 years old. So he did that when he was 17. And I still can see the big dent in his hand from it. So it is essential to use the right piece of equipment for the right job. We classify equipment accordingly. We have utensils, mechanical, and fixed. When purchasing equipment, we need to consider many things. We need to consider the space we're working in. I'm going to refer to my husband again because he has been working in the same business since he was 17 years old. He's, um, as an apprentice, he's now the catering manager. That business turns over $6 million a year in catering sales. Started off as a little bistro type situation, so it's part of an RSL club um, and has now progress to the point where lunchtime they probably seat about six or seven hundred people, same for dinner as well every single day. On top of that they might do six or seven private functions as well including weddings, wakes, high teas, table d'hote, sit down menus, a number of conferences, a number of um, opportunities there, birthday parties. So he's in charge of all that, he's in charge of about a hundred staff. Now, the place where he works underwent a renovation about three or four years ago where they were rebuilding the kitchen, having an open kitchen, wood fire pizza oven where people could see in and watch the chefs. Very trendy these days. Nice to see um, the chefs working. And having to redo the kitchen and design a whole new cafe and bar area, it's very hard to visualise that. You can imagine what that would look like. So what his boss did is he invested some money, $40,000, in building a mock version of what the kitchen was going to look like to scale. So they hired a great big warehouse, big room, probably bigger than all this area here, and they built the kitchen out of styrofoam. It was amazing. I went to her and had a look at it. And, um, and then he could visually see what the kitchen was going to look like. Is, was it going to work? You're spending millions of dollars something like $20 million renovation, you don't want to get it wrong. And as it was, there were a few things wrong and he went through, he sorted it out and he changed the specs so that it was more in suiting to what he wanted and it now works very well. And as a result of that, um, he's probably operating one of the biggest catering ventures um, in clubs in New South Wales. So it's been quite an achievement for him. So having that correct equipment can really impact your business. It may reduce preparation time, conserve energy, increase safety and so on. So it's really important you look at the space you're working in. Small equipment examples, things like measuring items, 
storage containers, moulds, tins. I'm not talking about mould that grows on food, the little Dario moulds. I'm talking about the, you know, you make cream caramels in those Dario moulds, that kind of mould. Crockery, knives, tools, saucepans. Pans, stockpots, graters, strainers, thermometers, all of those things. Large equipment. So we seem to have missed mechanical equipment here. All right, so large equipment includes things like combi steamers, deep fryers, dishwashers, brat pans, cool rooms, freezers, things that are fixed that you can't move around. Even char grills, ovens, ranges. So we're talking about stove tops, stock pots, sometimes a bain marie, depending on the size. Our other type of equipment, which doesn't seem to be in the slide, is mechanical equipment. So we're talking about small electrical items like slicers, food processors, stick blenders, that type of thing. Of course, it's essential that we clean and maintain kitchen equipment. Aphrodite spoke before about situations where uh, chemicals have been left on equipment. So this is really important, especially um, using a dishwasher. It's important you've got the correct dosage of your um, detergent and your rinse going through to ensure all residue gets removed. So when we clean equipment, of course, we need to loosen food particles by soaking, scraping or pre-rinsing. We need to use hot water with detergent, scrubbing, scouring, jet spraying. One of the common things we use in the industry is those stainless steel scourers, those curly ones. Anyone seen those? The problem with those, they deteriorate after a while and they tend to leave shavings of metal. So that can be a common thing that gets found in food. Metal shavings from scourers. Sometimes they even take, um, if it's a um, metal pan, it might even take some of the residue off. So we need to be careful. We need to rinse, very important. And as Aphrodite said before, chefs do wash up and have to clean. It's a rare luxury that you have someone cleaning up after you. I don't think I ever had a job in the industry where I didn't wash up every day. And it was a huge amount of washing up. We need to make sure we sterilise by using a chemical sanitizer or a boiling water. One job I had, uh, I wasn't, we weren't allowed to use tea towels because it spread bacteria. It was a, I was actually working in a hospital for a while, so we had a clientele where um, they were already unwell, so they didn't need additional issues of getting food poisoning. So we had to air dry everything, so we had racks. So you'd wash up and you'd place pots upside down on the shelves with holes in them and they just drip dry. So we did not have a tea towel in the kitchen. Sounds incredible, doesn't it? But we didn't. We had, obviously we had pot holders to get things out of the oven, but we weren't allowed to use a tea towel. Dishwashers, final cycle, must be above 80 degrees because we need to get rid of all that airborne bacteria. And as I said before, you can air dry or you can tea towel dry, but the recommendation is to air dry. It's much more hygienic. Of course, we use a lot of electrical equipment, so we need to make sure it's safe. I went to a school the other day while I was helping with an assessment, and I plugged their salamander into the PowerPoint, and the on-off switch, the light flickered on and off, and I thought, oh, what's going on here? So I pulled the plug back out, and then it was all black, and the plug itself had melted. Luckily, their safety switch had cut in, otherwise I probably wouldn't be standing here now. So I didn't feel a jolt or anything, I was very lucky. But um, you need to be aware if you see anything faulty. So straight away, I got the kitchen assistant to put a sign on the salamander to make sure that it didn't get used by another student and another sign on the actual PowerPoint because where you stick the prongs of the power uh, plug in was actually black as well. Some of the plug had melted into it. Never put your hands close to live electricity or the moving parts of the unit. Make sure you're always using guards, very important. Who has, anyone have a big Hobart, like a big mixer 
and the in their kitchen. Mm. No. Do we all make sure we have our hair tied back? Um, it can happen where people have can be scalped by getting their hair caught in equipment. We should always make sure we switch everything off and remove power plugs prior to cleaning. Do not use electrical equipment in wet areas. So in your washroom or near a sink, you should not have equipment. Caring for your knives. Knives are a very expensive item. And if you've got a good knife, you want to keep it. So you need to look after it. I think we all know the basic rules about carrying the knife pointing downwards. Um, not handle it by the blade, that kind of thing. Not put in a sink full of wa soapy water. Who's done that before? I've had that done to me and stuck my hand in the sink and cut myself a few times. Usually my husband does that to me. <laughs> yes. Uh, potentially you may. Yep. My advice is to go through past papers. So the question was asking would we get questions like this in the exam. Go through past papers and have a look. I cannot predict what's going to be in the exam, unfortunately. Um, if I could, everyone would do really well. But I can't. I, my advice is just to go through everything and just pick out anything you think might be relevant. But you can sometimes go through papers, and I'm not going to tell you to predict, but sometimes you can go through and think, oh, they haven't asked that question around that for a while. Maybe that's going to come up. But I would, my advice would be to talk to your teachers. They're the experts. They're the ones that have been teaching you the course. Um, if you're having any HSE workshops in the school holidays, make sure you go and get that specific knowledge from your teacher. Um, the chef knife is the most basic tool that we have. It is that one, that third one down. It's a very versatile tool. It's one you can use for pretty much everything. You can use the blade as a flat to say crush garlic. You can use it as a um, cleaver. You can use it for slicing, dicing. So it's the main knife a chef will use. Going back to my um, daughter's partner, when he worked at Gordon Ramsay's restaurant, they were only allowed to bring with them a chef knife a paring knife and they're sharpening steel. So you can see by that kit, most chefs will have seven or eight, nine knives. He was only allowed to bring those three items with him. I'm not sure why, but I guess that's what they felt, that's all you needed. You need to look after it, don't put them in the dishwasher of course, especially if they're wooden handled, because um, it will deteriorate them. And I think we're just about done. And once again, as I said, caring for your knives, make sure you don't put them through dishwashers. Don't leave them in sinks. Make sure they're wrapped. Does everyone understand that when you carry your knife kits around, it's actually illegal to have them unlocked? So you must have a padlock on them. You shouldn't pull them out. I'm sure your teachers probably told you that when you've gone out on work placement. Do you purchase your own knives? Or do you, are they supplied by your school? Most people. Both? Bit of both? Yeah, I think that's probably the general idea. Well, are there any questions around kitchen operations? Do we have any questions from our online listeners? Nothing? Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. I uh, appreciate your time. We will probably be heading out for your tour and lunch soon. Um, we'll wait for the others to come back and then we'll go into the last session of the day. So thank you.